Welcome everyone. My name is Michelle Johansson. I'm a physician at Johns Hopkins and I also do research in the area of embolic stroke. And I'm very excited to speak to you today about this concept. This will be a two-part lecture. The first part is going to discuss embolic stroke, a primer, meaning what do we already know about stroke and what are important things to consider as a physician when you go to treat a patient that you might think has an embolic stroke. And then the second lecture will focus more on future directions, as well as exciting research in this area. So let's get started. When we think about ischemic stroke, it's really important to think about the etiology of the stroke. So for example, there is stroke due to small vessel disease. There's non-small vessel disease stroke or non-embolic stroke. And then there's this whole group of stroke that we think of with regards to embolic stroke. Embolic stroke is our topic today. And when we think about embolic stroke, there's different etiologies within embolic stroke that are important to consider. And this is gonna be one of the take home messages today from our talk, because many people think of embolic stroke as one entity, when that in fact is not the case. There's non-thrombosis mediated embolism and there's thrombosis mediated embolism. So how do you think about these two things differently? Well, for example, there are emboli that can come from the heart. There's emboli that can represent arteriogenic plaque. And then there's a paradoxical embolus, which as some of you probably are familiar, that's where an emboli crosses from the venous system over to the arterial system. So within this catchment area of embolic stroke, there's different ways that we can think about the mechanism. And this is important because mechanism dictates treatment. Cardiogenic embolism is where we're gonna start. But just because it arises from the heart doesn't mean it's a thrombosis mediated embolus. For example, there's non-thrombotic cardiogenic embolism that can happen in the setting of cancer, for example. And that's not the same as clots that arise from valvular disease or from chamber embolism, for example. Arteriogenic embolism, we'll talk about briefly. The treatments for this is different, so just keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this talk together. Stroke etiology, we spoke briefly about this concept. And essentially, when you think about what causes a stroke, it's really important to diagnose the stroke properly because in diagnosing the stroke properly, you're able to treat the patient appropriately. This is just an example of three different classification systems that we use when thinking about stroke etiology. So for example, the TOAST classification is probably the one that's most familiar to physicians. It's been around for a while and it divides strokes into these categories, specifically large artery atherosclerotic disease, cardiac embolism, small vessel occlusion or lacunar strokes, strokes of other etiology. And this essentially means that um, there's some other cause, for example, a dissection um, or maybe a hypercoagulable state. And then there's this concept of stroke of undetermined etiology, which can be extremely frustrating for physicians as they go to treat a stroke patient. And that's because it essentially means we don't know what caused the stroke. So if we can't identify the cause of the stroke, how are we going to prevent another one from occurring? Stroke of undetermined etiology in this TOAST classification system essentially means that there could be two or more causes identified by the time the patient is discharged. So you're not quite sure which category the patient fits. It could be a negative evaluation, meaning you've done all the testing that you can think of to do and everything has been normal. Or it could be an incomplete evaluation. And this was included in this TOAST classification when thinking about strokes of undetermined etiology. Now TOAST is the one that I'm going to be refer referring to throughout this lecture, but it's not the only one. There's something called the Causative Classification of Stroke System, or CCS, as well as the ASCOT classification. And these essentially take stroke mechanism and they add to it the weight of evidence. So for example, in TOAST, where there's two or more causes identified, this one takes weight of evidence and says, is it the sole potential mechanism of the stroke? 
is there perhaps more than one mechanism, but one is more probable than the other? Or is it just possible, meaning it looks like it could cause a stroke, but the mechanisms are less well defined? Stroke of undetermined etiology can also be called cryptogenic stroke. So those two terms will be used uh, interchangeably throughout this lecture. And I spend some time here just to say that when you're thinking about stroke, sometimes it can be easy to think, oh, well, the patient definitely fits in this classification system or that classification system, but that may not always be the case. So once again, if we're gonna treat embolic stroke patients appropriately, we have to diagnose them appropriately. And that's where we will lead into, especially in future directions, with regards to some exciting stroke research. So let's start with cardioembolic stroke. Cardioembolic stroke, when defined according to the TOAS classification system, which here is mentioned the original paper, which is used in many, many studies to classify stroke, specifically refers to patients with an arterial occlusion, presumably due to an embolus arising in the heart. Makes sense. And the sources are divided into high risk and medium risk groups. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And it basically high risk versus medium risk means a propensity for embolism. So for example, more things are gonna be more common in causing a clot than other structural deficits. So that's where we get into high risk versus medium risk. Large artery atherosclerotic sources of embolism should be eliminated. That's important. And that is once again, getting back to that TOAS classification system. Okay, so high medium risk sources of cardioembolism. Since I do research in this area, I get this question quite a bit. What is a high risk source of a cardiac clot? And what is a medium risk? It doesn't matter. There are also things called low risk. And normally low risk is not lumped into cardiac embolism. I'll go through some of these with you, but the important take home point as you're treating stroke patients is that there's some things that we have more evidence for and some things that we doesn't, don't necessarily have as much evidence for, but they're still lumped in together as necessitating treatment or anticoagulation for a cardiac embolus. And we'll get to that uh, a little bit later in the lecture. So for example, atrial fibrillation, we'll talk about that in more detail. Mechanical prosthetic valve. People know that patients with mechanical prosthetic valves should be on anticoagulation to prevent development of a clot, which could then embolize and go to the brain and cause a stroke. Recent myocardial infarction. People also know that that is a high risk source of forming a clot and leading to a stroke. Similarly with left ventricular thrombus. That's one of the reasons why, as stroke physicians, we look at the heart, is to see whether or not there's a clot that's formed there. And if there is one, that could indicate the cause for the stroke, and that patient should be treated with anticoagulation. Infective endocarditis certainly has a high risk of emboli, right? But this clot is different. It's an infective clot. It's not the same clot that arises from atrial fibrillation and treating these patients with anticoagulation can be detrimental. It should not be done. Medium risk sources, atrial flutter, frequently gets lumped in with atrial fibrillation. Those patients are also normally treated with anticoagulation. And there are some others listed here, congestive heart failure, et cetera. And the evidence differs for some of these about what the treatment is. But once again, the takeaway message from the slide is that there are cardiac structures that we can identify that we know have a higher propensity of forming a clot than other ones. So then the question becomes, what do we do about those other structures when identified? And we'll get to that in the second lecture. So cardioembolic stroke, once again. Cardioembolic stroke in general is more severe than other stroke subtypes. There's a five-year mortality rate for cardioembolic stroke, and this has been reported as high as 80%. There's also a higher risk of recurrence when you have a cardioembolic stroke. And the typical presentation is that it's maximal in onset, it can be sudden in onset, frequently can lead to large artery occlusion, that LVO, that's frequently um, used to define whether or not we're going to take a patient for endovascular therapy, for example or you can see it in multiple vascular territories. 
So what are the most commonly cited clinical features of a cardioembolic stroke based on the evidence? Well, an isolated focal deficit. Of course, that doesn't surprise us as stroke physicians. It normally is referable to the vascular territory that's involved. A seizure at onset, loss of consciousness at onset. Remember, it's maximal when it first presents. The peak of deficit at onset, symptoms suggesting involvement of greater than one vascular territory, or evidence or suggestion of systemic emboli. And why does that make sense? Well, if it's a more proximal source and it shoots from the heart, for example, it doesn't necessarily always just have to go to the brain. It could go other places as well. So what are findings on imaging that you can think of when you think of embolic stroke? Well, embolic stroke normally, classically, is multiple infarcts in more than one territory. So this is an example of a brain MRI from a patient that I took care of that shows multiple infarcts in more than one territory. This is a DWI sequence, diffusion weighted image, and bright means acute ischemia. So you can see it's on both the right and the left side of the brain. You can see that it's both in the anterior and posterior circulation, um, and there was more emboli further down in cerebellum and the brainstem. It can be both deep and superficial, right? So deep meaning deep parenchyma, superficial meaning more superficial. Hemorrhagic conversion is actually also uh, quite common with embolic strokes. And we've written some papers on this recently talking about what predisposes someone to bleed into the stroke bed if they do in fact have an embolic stroke. Uh, absence of large artery stenosis or occlusion in the parent vessel, of course that makes sense. That's how we define a cardioembolic stroke. And then rapid recanalization. These patients are known to rapidly recanalize once given IVTPA, for example, or sometimes you even take these patients for endovascular therapy and the clot will have already gone away. So maximal and onset, rapid recanalization. Once again, these are classic findings. Each patient is different. It can be very different for your patient and they can still have an embolic source, but these are sort of good things to cement in your mind when you think about an embolic stroke. So how do you evaluate a patient for an embolic stroke? Well, physical examination, of course, is the first thing we always do. We wanna talk about temperature, is the patient febrile? Cardiac auscultation, you wanna to listen to the heart and lungs, of course. Assess for peripheral edema a retinal examination and a skin examination. Why? Because you wanna look once again for the possibility of an embolic shower, meaning it not only went to the brain, but it also involved the eye and possibly the skin. Imaging studies, CT or MRI of the brain, um, they're both, you know, MRI of course is preferred because it gives us more detail about the actual structure of the brain, but if that's impossible for some reason, CT is a good place to start. Uh, and then vascular imaging, you of course want to look at the vessels of the head and neck, and then a chest x-ray to look for a possibility of malignancy, if there's a pulmonary infiltrate, et cetera. Cardiac monitoring, we'll talk about this a little bit more. When we talk about cardiac monitoring, we specifically refer to serial EKGs or ECGs, cardiac telemetry, uh, where the patient still has uh, monitoring that's ongoing in, in the cardiac unit, uh, and then extended cardiac monitoring. And that can be a whole lecture in and of itself about how long you monitor someone for, et cetera. We'll review the evidence for that briefly today. Cardiac evaluation. Now, this is a question that is of great interest to many, including uh, me at Hopkins and the research that we're doing. Classically, though, I will say that echocardiography is normally what's used for cardiac evaluation. Um, and that refers to either transthoracic or transesophageal. Um, and there's benefits uh, to both, and they evaluate structures differently. Obviously, transesophageal is used to confirm presence of a PFO or a patent for amino valley, for example. And then laboratory evaluations, you could think about a white blood cell count to see whether or not someone is infected. You could think about an ESR. Uh, CRP to see if there's markers of increased inflammation. Blood cultures might be important, especially if you're thinking about an infective endocarditis. Thyroid function test. Now, possibly someone who has hyperthyroidism could have a cardiac arrhythmia, for example. And then antiphospholipid antibodies, uh, an increased predisposition to clot. They can also get 
um, non-thrombotic emboli that seed the heart that can also go to the brain. So let's speak briefly about atrial fibrillation and talk about the mechanisms of atrial fibrillation. AFib or AF is responsible for nearly half of all cardioembolic strokes and it's known to increase with age. So in your older patients, uh, this is certainly something you should be thinking about for embolic stroke. Now short asymptomatic periods of atrial fibrillation can be sufficient to form a thrombus. And it's believed to be caused by embolization from the left atrium and the atrial appendage. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. So why does atrial fibrillation cause stroke? Well, it has to do with stasis of flow, which leads to clot formation, and then that subsequently can embolize. So how do you diagnose atrial fibrillation? So an important point here is that the absence of symptoms of AF does not exclude a diagnosis of AF. So the classic symptoms that patients could describe would be a reduced exercise tolerance, shortness of breath, and palpitations but they don't necessarily have to have that presentation to have paroxysmal, sometimes silent or subclinical atrial fibrillation. So where do you start? Well, an EKG is a cost-effective first step. There's been research to show that if an EKG was done, actually considered in clinical care, we might be able to increase our yield of diagnosing AF. But there are certainly different types of cardiac monitoring that you can consider. A Holter monitor, it's an ambulatory electrocardiogram, a real-time continuous heart monitor, which gives you beat-to-beat -beat variability, an external loop recorder, and then finally, if you want to monitor a patient for a longer period of time, you can put in what's called an implantable loop recorder. And here are some examples of those in the lower corner. Uh, they're very small devices. Normally, patients tolerate them well and they're inserted right underneath the skin and can be done as a bedside procedure. So subclinical atrial fibrillation is noted in 35% of patients with ICDs. That's remarkable. They didn't have any symptoms. They had a device in that was monitoring them for other reasons, and subclinical AF was noted in 35%. AF that's subclinical also carries a stroke risk. So the ASTART study, uh, showed that a single episode of atrial fibrillation lasting at least six minutes during the first three months after device implantation experienced a 2.5 fold higher hazard of stroke. And they followed these patients for about two and a half years. Longer monitoring appears to increase yield. So the EMBRACE trial looked at 30 day monitoring versus just a whole term monitor that was done for a much shorter period of time and they captured 16% of subclinical atrial fibrillation versus only 3% with the whole term monitor. So if you're really convinced a patient has atrial fibrillation that you're just not capturing, it appears that the longer you monitor the patient, the more likely you are to diagnose that AF. This is just a really nice handout from the American Heart Association that we use in educating our patients about atrial fibrillation. It defines what atrial fibrillation is, it defines what the symptoms are, but it also points out that you could not have any symptoms at all and still actually have atrial fibrillation. It points out that it's linked with a five times higher stroke risk. There's actually racial disparities when it comes to atrial fibrillation and the risk of stroke. And then of course it alludes to the patient that you wanna be sure to talk to your physician about it because there are medications that you would need if you have atrial fibrillation. So a nice way and a concise way to communicate to a patient about atrial fibrillation. All right, why is anticoagulation recommended? So I'm gonna walk you through this concept of white thrombus, red thrombus, et cetera. So antiplatelet agents prevent formation of a white thrombus. So platelets aggregate that form in the setting of fast flow in arteries and perhaps on heart valves. Now compare that to red thrombus, stasis, such as in the left atrial appendage, which is a particular area of the left atrium, in atrial fibrillation, in ventricular dyskinesia, meaning the ventricle is not pumping appropriately, and in deep veins, is from stasis, you form a clot, and that is a red thrombus or a red type material. It results from polymerization of fibrin, 
formation of a mesh of long fibrin strands, and then entrapment of red blood cells. That's sort of the way that it's thought that this clot forms. So to prevent formation of a red thrombus, it's necessary to use anticoagulants. So this is why antiplatelet agents are much less effective than anticoagulants in preventing stroke from atrial fibrillation. So just a little bit of a review there, but that's an important concept to keep in mind as we go forward. Anticoagulation for stroke prevention, this is very familiar, I'm sure, for, for most of you. Uh, this is just an example of the CHADS-2 score versus CHADS-2-VASC. It's obviously different. CHADS-2-VASC includes more demographics here. And the benefit of CHADS-2-VASC is that it more accurately identifies truly low-risk patients, and it reclassifies many CHADS-2-stroke patients to a higher stroke risk. So these are things that we can think about in trying to figure out risk of stroke and atrial fibrillation and whether or not we should initiate anticoagulation. Okay, anticoagulation for stroke prevention, what medication do you use? Once again, this could be a whole lecture in and of itself. I point out to you these only to say that these are the most commonly used. Adoxaban was recently approved. Warfarin, of course, is a vitamin K antagonist. And then dibigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban all act differently. Uh, dibigatran inhibits thrombin. Rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban are 10A inhibitors. And this is just a reminder of that lovely coagulation cascade that we all had to learn as becoming physicians. These all act differently. They all have things to consider in prescribing them. And they're cleared either renally or through the liver. They have different half-lives, they're dosed at different times. So these are all considerations when thinking about your patient sitting in front of you and what you would prescribe for stroke prevention. So risk of stroke versus risk of rebleeding is a question that I get quite commonly. People say, how do I know whether or not a patient should be on anticoagulation? Are they too high of risk of bleeding of anticoagulation? And is that higher than their risk of stroke? So the has blood score is something that uh, many have heard about and it estimates risk of hemorrhage with warfarin. The has blood score uses data from a real world cohort of a whole bunch of anticoagulation patients and it subdivides these atrial fibrillation patients into three risk stratifications. A score of zero indicates low risk, one to two indicates moderate risk, and higher than three indicates high risk. So what composes a score? Well, the things that you could think of that should be in a risk score that would tell you about risk of hemorrhage on warfarin. High blood pressure, of course, abnormal renal or liver function, stroke history, bleeding history, a labile INR if they're elderly, and drug and alcohol, and then you calculate the score and that gives you information about their risk of bleeding. Okay, now that's important to consider, absolutely. But I wanna drive home the point that actually anticoagulation is underused in stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation. Bleeding risk associated with falls or advanced age usually is outweighed by stroke prevention. And I put this number here because it's pretty powerful. It would take about 295 falls to equal the risk of not taking anticoagulants in atrial fibrillation. So think about that the next time you have a patient in front of you. Elderly patients are certainly at increased risk for both ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. And I list the fact that if it's a GI issue, you can normally prevent it. Um, you can normally prevent uh, intracranial hemorrhage with good blood control. And then there was a big meta-analysis that showed that anticoagulation extends to elderly patients. So what's the problem with atrial fibrillation? So I wanna tease you here just a little bit as we start to move into our next lecture. So atrial fibrillation, once again, is an important concept to know. It's important to recognize it. It's important to investigate it. And it certainly is a very strong causative agent when we think about cardioembolic stroke. But atrial fibrillation is not necessarily the whole picture. And this is what a group of us is doing a lot of research on. There's a lack of clear temporality, meaning that a third of patients with atrial fibrillation and stroke have no atrial fibrillation until after the stroke. There's a lack of specificity, meaning there are other stroke etiologies that can occur in patients with atrial fibrillation. We've seen it, 
patients will come to the hospital and they've had a lacunar stroke, for example, a small vessel disease stroke. And just because they have atrial fibrillation doesn't mean that was a cause of the stroke. And then finally, treatment of fibrillation is not sufficient to prevent embolization. So maintaining normal rhythm does not eliminate stroke risk. So in light of that, it's possible that atrial fibrillation is simply one mechanism by which stroke can occur, but there's a whole continuum now that is starting to be increasingly recognized in taking care of stroke patients. Vascular risk factors certainly can lead to large vessel disease, small vessel disease, heart failure, valvular disease, things that we know about already, and those can lead to stroke. But it's possible that there's something going on in the left atrium that may or may not manifest as atrial fibrillation that can independently cause stroke, which is an exciting area of research. So embolic stroke of unknown source, I'll, I will end with this concept and tease a little bit for the next lecture. So embolic stroke of unknown source was a concept that was introduced in 2014 in this editorial that I've included below. And it distinguishes a group of patients currently defined as cryptogenic, but may represent a more specific entity. Cryptogenic strokes, remember that was that group where we didn't know the cause of the stroke, is now thought to comprise about 25% of all ischemic strokes. So in this editorial in 2014, they propose that embolic stroke of undetermined source are a therapeutically relevant entity, which are defined as a non-lacunar brain infarct without proximal arterial stenosis or a known cardioembolic stroke. So I'll just close by saying that the best preparation for tomorrow is to do today's work superbly well. And this is by Sir William Oser, who of course was invaluable in the founding of Johns Hopkins. So in closing out this lecture, it's important to recognize embolic stroke is composed of multiple different entities, and that those entities, you have to think about the causative agent, and the causative agent dictates treatment. And then now we'll move into some more advanced concepts, including this ESIS notion and how you should treat those patients.